Welcome to the Tobacco Online Policy Seminar. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Maria Mirza, Senior Economist at the University of Illinois, Chicago. Uh, TOPS is organized by Mike Peskel at the University of Missouri, C. Shang at the Ohio State University, Michael Darden at Johns Hopkins University, and Jamie Hartman Boyce at the University of Massachusetts, um, Amherst. The seminar will be one hour with questions from the moderator and discussant. The audience may post questions and comments in the question answer panel, and the moderator will draw from these questions and comments in the conversation with the presenter. Please review the guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable questions. Please keep the questions professional and related to the research being discussed. Questions that meet the seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter afterwards, even if they're not read aloud. Your questions are very much appreciated. This presentation is being video recorded and will be made available along with the presentation slides on the TOPS website, tobaccopolicy.org. I'll now turn the presentation over to today's moderator, C. Shank from the Ohio State University to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Um, today, we continue our winter spring 2024 season with a single paper presentation by Brandon Cirillo entitled Estimating the Effect of E-Cigarette Taxes on E-Cigarette and Cigarette Sales in Canada. This presentation was selected via a competitive review process by submissions through the TOPS website. Brandon is currently in his fourth year of an economics PhD program at the University of Missouri. Brandon's research extends to policy analysis and political economy, encompassing topics such as permitted to purchase laws and voting behavior. His diverse portfolio also includes ongoing projects on drug testing and SNAP, counter-mobilization in voting, opioid reformulation, and the tobacco. Over the next 15 months, uh, he will be an intern at the Office of Management and Budget, concurrently working on his dissertation. He is poised to enter the job market in 2025. Dr. Michael Pascal, a professor of economics at the University of Missouri, is a co-author of the study and will answer select questions in the Q&A. Our discussion today is Emmanuel Grindon, an associate professor in the Department of Health Research Methods, Evidence and Impact at McMaster University. Brandon Cirillo, thank you for presenting for us today. All right, whoops. Thank you for that introduction. And thank you everybody for organizing this and attending today. Um, I am, sorry, okay. Uh, as mentioned, I, I am Brand Cirillo. I am a PhD candidate at the University of Missouri. And believe it or not, this is my first virtual presentation. So along with comments on the paper, please let me know if I do something that I shouldn't be doing when doing virtual. I somehow dodged the COVID pandemic virtual presentations. And uh, this is my first one, but I am excited to be presenting estimating the effects of e-cigarette taxes on e-cigarettes and cigarette sales in Canada. Now before, now, before getting into it, I have a few disclaimers. This research reported in this publication was supported by Health Canada. Results and, and conclusions do not necessarily reflect the views of Health Canada, and I have received no tobacco-related funding over the last 10 years. And Perhaps most importantly to me, this is a work in progress. So uh, we, I appreciate and we appreciate any feedback. There's still stuff that we plan on changing within this presentation this, and the, uh, the end results potentially if we make some modifications. So your comments are extremely useful and will help us make this paper better. And we, prevent, we plan to submit early in this year. All right, so on to the paper, but not, not to the policies that we're looking at just yet. First, I want to talk about e-cigarette taxes as a whole, and I want to talk about the broad tax policy that could be considered um, risky risky taxes or sin taxes. And I like to think of these taxes as policy tools, and so I think I like to break them down into there's intended outcomes, I mean, intended outcomes as, as a result of these policies and unintended co uh, consequences. And so when we're thinking about e-cigarette taxes, we can think of these as a way to reduce e-cigarette usage. 
Uh, and to do this and to know how much we're going to reduce the, the usage of these products, we need to know if these taxes are even going to be passed on to the consumers. So thinking broadly here, if there's a sales tax, that's going to go directly to the consumer. But in excise taxes, there's going to be a pass through of some kind. And those taxes that are levied on the wholesaler or the retailer themselves. And so one thing we have to know is like, how much are we going to see a pass through get passed on to the consumers? And are they going to see that tax? Second question you have to ask is once those taxes are sent on to the consumers, how responsive are they going to be to those price those price changes? Are we going to see strong responses? Are we going to see weak responses? And so this can answer that first intended consequence, these two together. Are we going to see a reduction? Are we going to see an increase in price in the intended way? Now, of course, there are some unintended effects that could happen from these policy changes. And of course, uh, in the case of tobacco products, there's a substitution effect that could occur. And so if you push people from e-cigarette taxes by raising the price, you could push people to cigarette taxes. And so as a policymaker, when we're one, trying to understand if we're going to reduce harm, there's a few questions we have to understand. The general consensus is that e-cigarettes are less dangerous than traditional cigarettes, although how much so is still up for debate. And so we have to take into account the relative health differences by moving people off of e-cigarettes as well and vice versa. And so that's something that I wanna look at and that's something that the, these policies allow us to check as well. Are we seeing substitution effects to cigarettes and potentially we have to take that into account when we wanna analyze if the health effects for the public are gonna be positive or negative. And so then specifically as it relates to what we discuss in this paper, we're, we have some studies that I, I go over here that are done in the United States. And so just to summarize the literature really quickly before going into it in too much detail, the, there are differences in the literature. There aren't necessarily agreements on the strength of the responses, although the direction of the responses, there is some agreement. And so just keep that in the back of your mind as we go through these uh, results in the United States. And so the first question I wanna ask is, are, we, are the consumers going to see the taxes? So the United States, there's predominantly, they're using excise taxes instead of sales taxes. And so these two studies, Diaz et al. and Cadi et al., what they look at is uh, e-cigarette increase. And for example, if there was a tax increase and they find if there's a $1 tax increase on e-cigarettes, then the pass-through is either gonna be 49 cents or 90 cents, depending on the study. And so again, they agree on the direction and how, but they don't necessarily agree on the magnitude. And so we're going to add to that literature, uh, except looking at it in Canada. Furthermore, answering that second question, we need to know how responsive consumers are to the price changes. And so of course here, it's a similar to two of the same studies and then plus one additional one. And what we see is that they find that, for example, if there's a 10% increase in e-cigarette taxes and increase in taxes, there would be a reduction of either 0.4% or 6.3%, depending on the study. So the direction we agree on, but the strength of the response is still up for debate. And this again is with excise taxes in, in the United States. Alcott and Rafkin, they see a 10% increase in pricing resulting in a 13% decrease in sales in e-cigarettes. And this is a fairly elastic response, meaning that the response from consumers is fairly strong relative to the price increase, at least at the price point that they looked at. And so again, so it seems like there are there's going to be some response. We're going to have the intended consequence of pushing people off of e-cigarette use, but uh, the strength is still up for debate. And so then here we have e-cigarette taxes and looking at that substitution effect. Are we moving people to a different tobacco product? So if the, the same studies that we talked about on the last one, they see a 10% increase could result in an increase in cigarettes in cigarette sales. Again, this is e-cigarette taxes on cigarette sales of 0.1% or an increase of 1.2% depending on the study. And so the effect is also a little ambiguous. This is not that uh, statistically different from zero. And the strength is also a little bit ambiguous. So this is something that still needs to be figured out within the literature and there's no hard and fast rule necessarily just yet. Of course, sales data and pricing isn't the only way to analyze the effect of policy. We wanna know if people are using or are using more or less. And so we can use survey data for this. And so I'm gonna go over four quick studies that look at different demographic groups as it relates to an increase in e-cigarette taxes. And this also helps us get some insight into the substitution effect or if we're stopping, if we're getting rid of the habit altogether or if we're just pushing them to a different product. And so looking at adults under the age of 40, we see that this increase, a $1 increase 
would see a 3.6 percentage point decrease in e-cigarette usage. And then with under 25 year old adults, you see a reduction in 4.9 percentage points. Now, again, there's still, if you look at the, the second bullets in both uh, categories, there is some evidence of a substitution effect. So we're still seeing people remain smokers or switch to a different form of smoking at a pretty high rate. Looking at teens and pregnant women, again, you see a reduction in usage, 1.9 percentage points for teens and 1.7 percentage points uh, for pregnant women with the substitution to a daily smoking habit or a remaining daily smoking habit uh, being much smaller for pregnant women, but still really high for, for teens, at least compared to the adults. It's in the same range as the adults in the previous slide. And so this is what's been done in the United States. And the, this leads us to the contribution of, of this paper. So we, this is the, we're looking at one of the first studies that looks at the, the impact of these taxes outside of the United States, as far as we're aware of. And there's a drastic difference between the tax policies in Canada and the tax policies in the United States. So the United States predominantly is using excise taxes and taxes on the whole, uh, wholesaler and retailers. So you, those can be seen in the list price and those, those can get passed through the list price. Sales taxes, on the other hand, are applied at the register upon purchase. And so what there is, there's an issue in the literature where the behavior of consumers is different, whether or not the tax is uh, salient. So it's either at the register or it's in the list price. And consumers are more responsive to the changes in tax policy if it's in the list price. And Golden and Ahamanov in 2023, they find that this, this result extends to the tobacco industry as well. So we're going to add to that because we have a difference of tax policy. We're looking at sales taxes and um, excise taxes. So we add to this, and we can also contrast our results with what they see in the United States. These are the specific policies that we're going to be looking at, the policy changes that occur. And we're going to start with uh, British Columbia, and they adopt the equivalent of a 13% e-cigarette sales tax. Now, I want to highlight this word equivalent because this is, not the, this is not the total sales tax. So this may be different than what you are aware of. If there's a tax different, if you think it's 20%, that's because that's the total tax on this good in the end, but the equivalent of a 13% on the e-cigarette, and that is above the goods and services tax in the province. So similarly for the other sales taxes, in Newfoundland, they adopted a 20% a 20 effective e-cigarette sales tax. And in... Uh, Saskatchewan, they also adopt a 14% e-cigarette sales tax. Now, by contrast, Nova Scotia adopts a excise tax. So, the, so this one can be observed uh, in, the, in the list price, or we expect to see it in the list price if there's a pass-through. And so just to color coordinate these, um, so again, the three in the red are sales taxes, and we might not necessarily see those, we're not gonna see those in the list price changes. And the blue, we're going to see, we could potentially look for a pricing impact and if it's gonna be passed through to the consumers. And again, there is no national e-cigarette tax until October in 2022, which is outside the range of our data that we look at at this time. And so then I will pause here for a quick discussion. Uh, thank you. Uh, let's turn to our discussion, Dr. Yundun today to uh, see whether he has any comments. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I do have a, f uh, a few things, comments and uh, questions. So comments, very minor. Uh, I, I really like to see uncertainty uh, 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 intervals when uh, point estimates are uh, presented, especially in this case when uh, estimates vary a lot. Uh, so it's useful t to see how, how precisely the, the, the uh, 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 estimates actually are. Do you have any insight as to why is it that the estimates are all over the place in the U.S.? Yeah, so I do have some insight uh, about the data differences, and maybe that is why uh, this is generating the the differences uh, in the estimates. Um, as for like the mechanism for why there might be uh, a difference, that I have. A little less inside too. So if I go back, um, just to make sure I have this right. Sorry about this. Just want to make sure I have the right one. Yes. Yeah, so the Cadi paper, the Cadi et al. paper, they have larger data set in more states in the United States uh, that they analyze. And so this, and then the DS paper, I believe, only looks at 23 states. Um, and it should be noted that the pass-through intervals they don't overlap. So those are statistically different from each other, um, as well as the other estimates. 
And so there could be a data difference. And so I think that could be driving it. Um, but as for any other mechanism, I'm not um, sure about what the mechanism that could be driving those differences. Okay, thank you. Um, you're looking at a change in Nova, in Nova Scotia that happened in uh, September, was it again, 2020? Uh, y yes. Yeah. And at the same time, there was a change in the, in the limits for nicotine. Uh, it went from, I think the highest that was allowed here was 60 or something like that. And at exactly the same time, it dropped to, to 20. So are you, uh, uh, it seems difficult to be able to, 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 dis to disentangle the impact of the tax from the impact of the uh, ch change in uh, limits on nicotine uh, concentration. Have you thought about which one might explain the results that you find? Yeah, that, that is certainly a concern. To make sure that I understand the situation correctly, the limits on the, I think the 20 per milliliter, uh, the limit on nicotine, that was a na national policy, correct? No, it was a, it was just... Um, yeah, only in Nova, in, in Nova Scotia at the time of the the, the tax increase. The national uh, policy now, I, I can't remember if we even have one, but it's l later. If if uh, it's if we have one, I think we do. Uh, but definitely, I, mean, I, I could be wrong, but I'm fairly certain that it happened at the same time. And I think okay. I'll go back to it because I think it has an, it might have uh, an influence on the data you actually use. Um, anyway, so yeah, I think this is, I don't know if it's a concern. I don't know if you, there's anything you can do about it, uh, but it's unfortunate that the two happen at the same time. So we, we can't really see that the, uh, the, uh, the, the difference be, between the two. Um, so what else do I have to say? Da, da, da. Uh, yeah, it was... The last one is um I don't know how many in in on in the audience actually know uh the difference between Nova Scotia and Quebec and Ontario and so on. So it would all it would also be useful to to uh uh provide that's just a little bit of information on how um uh the, the differences that we may have between the East and the West. So the the East Coast is typically poor. Uh, not a lot, but poor. It's not poor. And so the levels of income are lower than they are uh, out west and in, in Ontario and Quebec. But the uh, 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 population is, is, it tends to be uh, uh, older, and it's also very small. Uh, PEI, we're looking at 150,000 individuals, so it's a tiny little thing. New Brunswick, we're looking at 500,000, so it's the size of a small city. Nova Scotia is the biggest one. I think it's 1.5 million. So it, it, it's it's small <clears throat> relative to Ontario and, 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 uh, and, and Quebec and BC. So you, you don't use survey data, but with usually with sur sur survey data, it's harder to find anything significant over there. Because the, the the sample t tends to be quite small. Um. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah, I will definitely make notes that we want to highlight some of the differences and include some of the uncertainty intervals uh, going forward. Okay. Do I have anything else in my notes? No, I think that's all, sort of all, all I had at this point. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I don't see any questions from the audience. Uh, so please continue, Brendan. Thank you. Okay. So the next section before we pause again is just going to be over the data and methods before we get into the results. Um, and so the data for e-cigarette sales is uh, UPC level e-cigarette monthly sales data using the Nielsen IQ track stores. And when we say UPC level, we mean barcode levels. So we have very specific information about the product and what category the product is. And we aggregate that up and I'll talk about that in just a second. Um, our data for e-cigarettes ranges from the end of 2017 through the end of 2021. There are six province groups, so some are included individually and some are included, um, they're grouped together. Um, and in the analysis, the Nielsen 
IQ data, it contains all the gas station and convenience stores. And so this is most, if not all, but it's essentially all, it's 99% of the e-cigarette purchases that are tracked by Nielsen, but it's only one third of all sales in Canada. And so vape shops and online shops are not included. This does uh, give me an opportunity to say that if anyone knows about the vape shop or online data that might be available or how to get access to it, we would greatly appreciate that feedback. Um, that's something that would definitely strengthen the, the study. So for the data, what we do is we are able to identify the volume uh, of, the, of each product and using the UPC level, and we are able to identify it for 99.7% of the sales within this category. And so we're looking for liquid volume. We're then able to uh, aggregate the sales and the e-cigarette prices up to the province group level or the individual province if it's available. And so then I wanna make a quick note of what I talked about earlier, the difference between the sales, um, the sales tax and the excise tax. And that is Nielsen, if the excise tax, if there's a pass through to the retailers, I mean, the consumers, Nielsen, I, Nielsen IQ data will, will track that. However, the sales tax, we're not gonna see any impact on the price because we're not gonna track that chain. Nielsen's not going to track that uh, with their data. And additionally, this important caveat too is coupons are also not included in the Nielsen data. So there are some mechanisms for reducing the effective price to consumers that are not necessarily going to be observed in the data. And we'll talk about that in the discussion discussion section later. Over this time period, the price per a milliliter is $3.91. The average monthly sales per 1,000 people from the entire time period is 6.5 flu fluid milliliters. However, 2021, there's 13.6 uh, milliliter, milliliter usage. So the takeaway here is that there's a big ramp up in usage of e-cigarette uh, liquid starting in 2018 and going and still continuing um, to the end of our data. And so when we're thinking about the results, we're not necessarily looking for a reduction in usage of e-cigarettes. We're looking for more maybe a resistance to the propensity to increase consumption. And so I'll get, when I go into the results, I'll use a, a laser pointer and I'll talk through like what I'm seeing there. And we kind of control for these different growth and the growth the best we can, but that's something to keep in mind. We're looking for maybe a resistance to increasing, not necessarily reduction in total use. So then going on cigarette sales a little bit more, it's a little bit more rich. We have data, we have one extra year of data. Now, a quick note on that 2022 data, we are working on getting the 2022 data from the Nielsen IQ. Um, so we'll be able to add and have the same amount of data for both uh, very soon, hopefully. We're gonna have province level and monthly data for this. And this is going to contain all the province and territories, unlike the e-cigarette sales data that is missing some provinces and groups some together. And if we assume a 10% smoking rate, the average consumer consumes 500 cigarettes a month. And now just in case you're more familiar with United States PACs or Canadian PACs, and maybe PACs is an easier way to think of it. Um, in, in Canada, this would be 20 packs a month. In the United States, this would be 25 packs a month because the pack sizes are different. A quick note on that 10% smoking rate. We didn't just pull this out uh, uh, out of thin air. It is a reasonable round estimation for the smoking rate in Canada. And so that's why we use that, at least for this slide. The method for analyzing this, when we put this into regression, is going to be a two-way fixed effects model. And the treatment variables are going to be e-cigarette effective sales tax rates and the Nova Scotia e-cigarette tax policy. And that's going to be a dummy variable. And as pointed out by Emmanuel, the, the, that will include any other policy change that change at the exact same time. Uh, and so that's going to be a zero one dummy variable. So the fixed effects model is going to reduce potential confounding. And so what we want to control for is province differences uh, that they don't, don't, don't change over time. And we want to control for like national policy implementations that happen uh, at a specific year and month and then carry on out for the rest of the data set. And so time fixed effects allow us to control for, for those time sensitive and like maybe month specific cycle, uh, cycling that goes on with usage and also controls for national policy. And then the province and province groups, those are going to allow us to control for province differences. So there is a little concern, though, that there are going to be time varying within province sources uh, of confounding for the, the outcomes. And so what we think here is that we're going to control for these the best that we can. And we control for province level cigarette taxes and e-cigarette flavor restrictions that were going on at, during this time. Um, we also do province specific monthly uh, time trends. And this is going to account for the differential growth rates in the provinces 
over time. And we'll talk more about that in the methods section as well. Lastly, um, or, we are gonna perform a sensitivity uh, check by dropping 2020 um, and to try to get away from the COVID confounding issue. We're gonna present both results or mention both results. And this avoids some of the asymmetrical policy changes that are tough to model, uh, tough to like include variables for. So trade restrictions, uh, trade uh, barriers that may have happened in one province, but not the other, different COVID policies for store restrictions that may differ across, the, did differ across provinces. The sales are gonna be, the outcome of sales are gonna be logged. So the coefficients can be interpreted as percent change. For the Nova Scotia policy, we're gonna look at price as well. And then the regressions are going to be weighted from the 2020, uh, the 2019 population, and the standard errors are going to be clustered at the province level or the province group level. And again, I will pause here for a, a quick discussion. Hey, I'm back. Can you hear me? Just to make sure. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I had for, there's a, one thing I've forgotten to say uh, at the first break is that there is actually a study that looked at uh, e-cigarette initiation and in BC after the change in 2018 or in 19 what I can do is put the, the link to it in the in the, the the box later and they didn't find anything significant um okay um first question did, did you think of using cigarette price as well in your regression and if not why not? Yeah, so I didn't think about using cigarette prices um, in this for the excise tax. It does make sense if we're looking for the excise tax in Nova Scotia that the price of a substitute changing could allow for the price of a of, a, of the other product to change. Um, but for the sales tax, it just we didn't think it would be uh, an outcome look worth looking at because sales tax shouldn't affect the list price of the data that we have. No, but the. A an increase in say, cigarette price might send consumers to e-cigarettes, right? Yes, it, it could. Right? Um, and then the change you'll see in e-cigarette sales might not be related to the price of e-cigarettes. It might be related to the price of say, cigarettes. And since we, we have the data, I, I anyways, I thought that might be something useful to explore. Um, the Your data starts in December, 2017. Uh, before May, 2018, e-cigarettes were illegal. Uh, it, it, it doesn't mean that they were not available. So it was a bit of the far West where anything went, except that the major tobacco manufacturers were not in yet. So Philip Morris, Imperial, T Imperial Tobacco, BAT, and so on, entered the market only when it became illegal. So I wonder how it might affect your um, your results to have this huge change where very, very fast we went to, uh, there was no preferred brand because it varied a lot. Um, uh, convenience stores were doing their own mix in the back room of a liquid. And then within almost just a few months, Jewel just started to explode everywhere. Um, anyway, something to keep in mind that the, the market changed rap rap rapidly after it was regulated. <clears throat> so that, yeah, that happened in May, 2018. Um, my other question is about going back to the change in nicotine, the limits on nicotine concentration at the same time, is that you have 30% of the, the data and you don't have online sales. So you might expect folks in, in Nova Scotia to go buy online products that they can no longer find. And we know that especially for illicit uh, trade and e-cigarettes, it seems that uh, everything's coming from outside the country. Uh, so I wonder if it, it could be that we see a substitution to online sales as a result of the change in price and also the change in nicotine uh, concentration. And unfortunately, I do not know um, 
a data source that would actually have uh, online sales. However, CCHS, which is our largest uh, health survey, uh, started at, I don't know when it started, but definitely in 20, 2017 and 2018, it had a question on e-cigarettes. So that would be an extension or a different study to actually use survey, survey data as opposed to sales. And then you would have the whole thing as opposed to when you have 30% of the market. So that's for the the hmm? uh, I accidentally moved the slides. I'm sorry about that. Um, no, I think you're absolutely right about the, uh, the one of the clear limitations is that we don't have the online data. So we can't actually identify that substitution. Um, and then on the survey front, that is something that I am excited to uh, kind of pursue because I think you're right. It captures the whole the whole market. Um, I, I like a two-way fixed effect, like everyone li likes them, but it, it comes at a cost in the sense that you're losing variation across a pro across uh, uh, provinces. So you're only looking at within uh, province change. So I wonder if you don't force it and you actually use the information you actually have of uh, between uh, uh, province, how much it might affect the results. Um, you didn't mention, I'm assuming you're using OLS to estimate the models? Yes, using a two-way fixed device model, yep. Um, you have, your T is fairly large, right? But your problem is your N is only six, right? For the treatments? Yeah. Yes. Um, so how, how do you deal with serial, serial, serial correlation and heteroscedasticity, especially if your, um, your N is fixed? Um, yeah, that's a, that's certainly a concern about this. You mean like the standard errors are going to have an issue because there's so few, um, is that what you mean? It's just that OLS may not be the best approach in a, to estimate the, these models. There's a whole li li literature that comes from uh, 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 political science. Typically, when we have a, a, a panel data, the uh, aseptonic prop uh, properties are in N and, and not in T. But in your case, your N's fixed, you're stuck, right? And it's not in the US, you have 50. Here we typically have ten, and now you only have six, right? Mm. Um, and you, you, anyways, it's just a, a something to to think about. A lot of work's been done in the two thousand and two thousand ten by Beck and Katz in terms of uh, getting the the right the standard errors <laughs> using these types of uh, uh, m m m m m m m m models. Okay. Uh, and also, did, did you think of uh, non-stationarity in the in the data? Because essentially, you have time series. Um, did we think about non-state? You said non-stationary, yeah. as in like there's a trend. Exactly. Uh, mm. So we do our best to control for like the within the groups trend. So we can kind of control for that. <laughs> the year. Fixed effects should the year the year fixed effects. I mean the month by year fixed effects should help us control for the general trend in the country of the increased usage, um, and so we should be having we should have some controls for that. Yeah, but you could test fairly uh, easily to see if you have a, a unit root. I'm okay. assuming you, you use Stata, or if you use something like Stata, it's fairly easy to implement. It's been done. Okay. Um, I think that's all I have. Prices. Da, da, da. The, 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 the last one is so your your approach is kind of similar to a difference in difference, right? Yes, but not no, no, it's not exactly a difference in difference. The the difference in difference sort of I don't know how to call it movement has been sort of uh, a lot of new stuff has happened in the past two, two or three years. I came across a. Uh, a a new approach where they're using difference and difference with the con uh, con continuous uh, uh, treatment. And I thought it might be cool to use those new approaches. 
with thank the data you have. Yeah, thank you, Emmanuel. We need to move on. I, I'm sure the audience will love to see the results. Thank you. All right, I will continue on to the results. Um, and, and let me switch my, get the laser pointer up here so you can see what I'm referring to as we go through it. Um, and so I'm gonna show you four graphs looking at the unadjusted numbers, just to kind of get a sense of if we should expect to see, um, well, in our adjusted results before we get there. And so the big takeaway from this slide is that we don't see any visual evidence of a uh, effect on the prices as a result of Nova Scotia's uh, tax policy implementation, uh, their excise tax. And so how do we can, like, why do I say this? Well, in the, in the pre-intervention period, what we see is that the behaviors of Nova Scotia's province group and all other groups, non-tax groups, excuse me, uh, you see them behaving similarly in the pre-intervention period. Then the Nova Scotia policy happens. And in the post period, the behavior remains relatively flat, but similar to each other. So relative to each other, we don't see any like evidence that the prices are actually changing. And so then moving on to whether or not these, these taxes actually have an impact on the e-cigarette sales from the data we have. Um, now, you may be wondering, we're looking at four policies, we only see three lines. And that's because Newfoundland is one of the provinces that is not included in the e-cigarette uh, data. And so we don't have Newfoundland's policy right here. And so what you see here is that like we talked about uh, in the introduction, there's a ramp up that starts in the end of uh, 2018. And this is largely probably due to the fact that they were illegal before May uh, 2018, as Emmanuel pointed out. And so then here you see uh, some growth up to the mid midway through 2019. And then they see this leveling off across all the groups. And so they behave similarly, they've, let, they've reached a level, we see some parallel trends heading into the policy implementation. And this is heading into British Columbia's change. And so we're looking at the blue line here. And so the takeaway here is from the entire slide is that there's evidence that we do reduce e-cigarettes. And so we see this because the British Columbia implements this tax policy. And then you see the other three province groups all have this increase up to the next policy implementation and they all have this steady increase and British Columbia remains flat. So we take this as evidence of a resistance to increasing and therefore potentially the, the, the tax policy has an effect on e-cigarette sales. Now going into the Nova Scotia policy, so now we're looking at the green dotted line. Again, it behaves similar to the three non-treated in this area, heading into the policy change. And in post policy change, you see Nova Scotia sort of flat line, uh, flat, flatten out. British Columbia continues to be flat, while Orange, which is all others, and Manitoba and Saskatchewan continue to climb over this time period, but not right away. They ramp up eventually. So again, we see that there's some resistance to the propensity to increase usage that we see in the other, other provinces as a result of this policy. And we don't see any strong visual evidence here of the Saskatchewan policy having any impact, but that's why we think that there is some visual evidence that we could see, we could expect to see an e-cigarette tax uh, reduce the sales. And so then looking at cigarette sales and just looking at the sales taxes for now, um, and that's why Newfoundland is back, but uh, Nova Scotia is no longer here. We have three policies again, and we don't see any evidence of cigarette sales being uh, behaving differently as a result of these policies. And generally the, the reason we say this here is that in the pre-intervention period, you see the gaps are relatively the same across uh, this pre-period. The policy implementation happens, it is a New Year's resolution right here. So they all decrease, but they decrease relatively the same amounts uh, to their prior usage. And then they increase usage again. The policies remain, the gaps remain relatively the same in, at, at each implementation of a new policy. Uh, and that includes the Newfoundland tax and the Saskatchewan tax as well. So we don't think there's any evidence of cigarette sales being impacted by the policy change. And so then lastly, we're gonna look at the last visual evidence we're gonna look at is Nova Scotia's e-cigarette tax uh, on the differences uh, between e-cigarette sales between the treated and not treated provinces. And so what in, on uh, cigarette sales, excuse me, increase. And so what we think here is that there's some visual evidence that there could be a potential increase in cigarette sales as a result of this policy in Nova Scotia. And you might have to squint, but that the implementation of the policy, this red line, the intercept at this line is going to be slightly different. It, visually, it's slightly there. So there may be some very weak evidence that there could be a, a effect on cigarette sales. 
And so going on to the adjusted results, and what I mean by adjusted is now we're including controls, we're including the fixed effects, the, uh, the monthly time trends for each individual province or province groups. And we're, so we're expecting that this is what I mean by adjusted results. And they largely follow the unadjusted pattern I, I just demonstrated. So we don't find any uh, evidence that Nova Scotia's e-cigarette tax implement, uh, changes the pricing. This goes back to that first question we talked about at the very beginning, where do we see the pass-through actually happening as a result of these policies? It's unclear. We don't actually see any of these uh, effects on the pricing. This is a surprising result because we expect uh, producers to maximize their profit and therefore pass on this new expense onto the consumers. And we talk about this a little bit more in the discussion. And so then for the rest of the adjusted results, we see that if, if for example, there's a 100% increase in e-cigarette sales tax, this reduces e-cigarette sales volume by just 4%. And this is not statistically significant. However, we do have evidence of parallel trends, which is our identifying assumption for maybe believing these could be causal estimates if we believe that the model is correct. So we see that we have evidence of parallel trends assumption holding because the lead period to check whether or not there's early movement before the policy actually there's, we don't have any evidence of early movement. So we kind of believe our assumption here or have evidence to believe it. And then if we get rid of the COVID problem that we talked about earlier, the results remain similar and statistically insignificant. And so we don't find any statistical economic relationship between cigarette sales uh, either, but maybe the smallest increase, it, it, but not statistically significant it, evidenced by this 4.1 number. And so then going to the Nova Scotia tax policy, which is the excise tax, what we see here is that the tax re reduced e-cigarette sales by 39.7% in the Maritimes region. And then again, we have some support of that parallel trends assumption. We don't see any early movement before the policy implementation. Um, and this is significant at the 10% level. Nova Scotia's tax also increased cigarette sales by 5.6%. Uh, in Nova Scotia following this policy implementation. And again, we have evidence of parallel trends. Both estimates are, are associated with uh, associations increase in magnitude when dropping the 2020 COVID issue that we talked about in the methods section. I do wanna highlight just a pre uh, preview of the discussion just before we get there. This is surprising that there's behavioral impacts if there are no price impacts necessarily. So maybe there's a way that there's like a relative uh, price differences there's a way to like change the relative price that maybe not being observed in the data. So quickly, we see in the beginning when I talked about the literature, I highlighted that the, the there's differences in the literature and we don't necessarily know, we generally know the direction of the impacts, but we don't necessarily know how big they are. Our aim was to kind of provide evidence in one way or the other or try to make it better. And we didn't do that. So. We have some evidence that matches the United States. For, for example, we find that e-cigarettes have the intended consequence of reducing uh, e-cigarette sales and that the largest effects are when there's an excise tax. And that's the one that's most analogous to the United States. However, we also have the unintended consequence of raising cigarette sales monthly as a result of these policy changes. And this supports other literature that found that these could be substitutes. And so we continue in that literature. And we, so we find some results that mimic the United States. Um, excise tax, taxes appear to elicit far greater changes in consumer response than sales tax. So we add to the tax saliency literature where the consumer being able to see the price change before they get to the register has a profound impact on their behavior potentially in, in comparison to the sales tax. So this adds to the other literature that's looked at this and to back as specific agent uh, industries. And so we see some evidence that sales tax may be not be as effective at reducing usage where excise taxes may be if consumers can see it. However, with the, to, for this to be the case, we have to believe there's some other relative price increase that we can explain. And so we know we do add to the fact that sales taxes aren't, uh, aren't as effective, which has been seen in other tax sales literature, but we don't actually see a price increase. So it's tough to say the tax that we that Nova Scotia adds to that literature. However, if there's another price mechanism we can explain, then maybe we can still say that. So I discussed some of them here, but I think the one that's most captivating, the two that are most captivating are um, maybe there are coupon use uh, usages before the Nova Scotia policy change. So manufacturer manufacturers are reducing the price to consumers by offering these coupon rates, and then post the policy implementation, they no longer offer these. And so this could raise the relative price to consumers, but not be caught in the data that we have available to us. Secondly, uh, there's this, there's the uh, public like education 
literature that kind of says that like the public becomes more informed when these tax policies get implemented. And so you're going to raise the relative price to consumers without changing the price by informing them that e-cigarettes may be more harmful to them when you implemented this tax. And this has been seen in, in the paper on, on screen. And so we raise the the effective price without necessarily being able to measure the effective price. And so these are these I think are interesting results that could be looked at future in the future. Again, the limitations, I think the uh, Emmanuel and I have talked about a few of the limitations thus far. And, and so the one of them is the few clusters are treated and the few clusters just in general when it comes to e-cigarettes data. So getting different data as we're like more rich data, like online data could potentially help with this problem, but this is something that we have to look into. And also looking at survey data could also help us with this problem as well. Again, we also only capture one third of the marketplace. So as Emmanuel pointed out, you could be having a substitution just to a different form that we can't necessarily me measure. Um, and then we only, we only study uh, sales data. So we actually don't know how the products are being used or if the pattern of usage is the same. So um, thank you for, uh, listening. This is my contact information. And I also, I don't have a website up just yet, but I do have a LinkedIn. So please add me on there. And then I am ready for the last discussion with Emmanuel. Thank you. So Emmanuel, uh, do you have any comments? Yeah, I got just two, only two small things. It's something you raise is that the fact that it doesn't impact the price, but in Nova Scotia, you, you have this very large impact on sales. That it's hard to believe that it's driven by the, the change in tax. I would, if I, I don't say, say the results are all right. Uh, my interpretation would be that it might be the nicotine limits that are explaining the results, or it's substitu 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 substitution to online to vape stores uh, that you don't actually have in the data. So it's tough to um, uh, link both the effect you, you have on price with the effect you have on, on sales. Yeah, I, I think you're exactly right. That is something, the policy change for the nicotine levels definitely needs to be looked at. And I need to understand that a little bit better as well. Um, and yeah, you're exactly right. If those policies happen, since those policies happen at the same time, it's tough to disentangle them. And you're the, right. um the data you have, which are really close to zero starting in 2017, that would be what Nielsen has. The, the, the use was not zero, but it was really, it was un, un, unregulated. And it's so it's probably why, I mean, if I had to guess is that the, the data are not in, uh, were not, the, the, the cells were not captured by Nielsen. So, it might make sense to, to start uh, when you actually have legal data, uh, legal sales, as opposed to assuming it was zero when it wasn't. That is a great point. And I will, will definitely consider it, if not change that immediately. Thank you. Uh, so we also see some questions from the audience. Um, so there is a question from Francis Thompson. Did you look at the impact of the Nova Scotia vape flavor restrictions, which came into effect a few months earlier than the tax? Yeah, so we, we don't look at specifically, so we have tax, we have flavor restrictions in the data. So we control for that across different provinces and when they implement them. So we control for that to make sure that there's not a confounding with those policy changes. And um, so we have those results. I I think the coefficients on those, I think are, are negative if I remember correctly. I just looked at the regressions before this, uh, but I don't remember the size. Thank you. I think uh, Mike has cleared all the questions uh, in Q&A. Uh, I actually have a question uh, about the marketplace uh, in Canada. So we know that uh, there are also other alternative products like heated tobacco. So uh, have hmm. you considered um, products like that? And you know whether there are taxes and uh, substitution that may go in on, that may go on between this two, uh, several different products. Yeah, so I, I haven't considered that. I know that we kind of looked at a UPC, like so the product specific uh, regression instead of a, an aggregate to the state one. And so maybe you could capture some of those changes between products in that regression. 
Um, but I did not think about like the the heating tobacco or, or a product like that. I don't think I, I looked at that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't see any other questions. Um, so I think uh, we can pass this to our um, MC today, uh, Mariam, to take us out. Thank you, C. So we're about to close. However, if you still, if anyone still has any questions for later um, or any thoughts for Brendan, you can join us for the Tops of the Tops, which is an interactive group discussion offered immediately following the select Tops events this season. To join, please copy the Zoom meeting room URL posted in the chat and switch rooms with us once the event concludes. We leave this webinar room open for an extra minute after the end to give everyone a chance to copy the URL, which is um, bit.ly slash tops meeting, all lowercase. And thank you for to our presenter, moderator, and discussant. And finally, thank you to the audience of 170 um, people for your participation. Have a tops notch weekend. Thank you.